we'd love you, we don't want to perform, we want you to sing along with us, we want you to worship mm. with us. So we invite you to do that. And as we sing our first song, uh, it's going to be the offering as well. So, here we go. Mm.
sit down I'll invite Tom to come up and first of all give us the notices well done young people that was great thank you for that getting better <laughs> getting better every time uh, not many notices this week um, it's getting into the summertime where people are away and things aren't on but we do have our normal prayer prayer times Monday evening, 7.30, Tuesday morning, 10.30. And we still have Faithful Blend Community Cafe going on on Thursdays. That's running through most of the summer. So that's uh, 10.30 in, not in the green room, in, in the red room in there. Um, so do come along to that if you're able to. The other things I'm going to plug are around the youth. So two weeks t time on Saturday, we're planning uh, to go to the Peak District now a bunch of men, and including the boys as well, all went to the Peak District yesterday, and we got absolutely soaked. And we did a walk that was very challenging. Um, to be honest, they should have done a sponsored walk for that one. They, <laughs> the one I've got planned is not gonna be as difficult, but um, they all did amazingly. They led the way, and they got there first, so well done, boys. Um, but yeah, in a couple of weeks' time, we're planning to go to Matlock, um, do about 10K. It'll include the girls as well. And uh, they are collecting sponsorship. Thank you for those that have already started to sponsor. Um, Gabriel's list here is looking pretty good. Um, if you haven't already, and I know Daniel wasn't here last week, so do, do encourage them by sponsoring whatever you can give uh, to support LZ7 coming uh, into Rushton in March next year. And we do have a, I should just say, two weeks' time as well. That's a family day, so even for younger children, for all families, um, if, yeah, I'll be giving you more information about that. Um, so that's going to be in Matlock. Back to LZ7, we have a special guest today, uh, Simon King from Whitefriars Church, who has been very instrumental in uh, bringing this vision together and has been leading the way in planning and um, yeah, getting in contact with the band and everything that's happening. And I'm going to hand over to him to introduce a little promo video and tell us a bit more. Thanks, Tom. Morning. Thank you for your welcome. It's lovely to come here. Um, first of all, can I just say, brilliant seeing the kids, the young people playing at the front of the net. And, and when it, whenever this happens, I'm at White Fries, whenever it happens at White Fries, I always say to people, don't ever take that for granted, guys. Well, can you remember what it's like at school, how tough that is, being different, standing out, standing up for what you believe? That's a really tough gig. And these guys being up here, that's just phenomenal blessing. So thank you guys for playing this morning. I loved it. It's just great music, great uh, confidence and bravery, and just keep doing that, please. That's brilliant. So um, I'm Simon. I'm a member over at Whitefriars Church. I think it's over there. Um, but more importantly, um, I'm here today as, as a dad of a teenage daughter. 
some of you know what that's like. Um, but I'm actually here on behalf of the Illuminate Mission Delivery Group, and David and Tom are very much part of that, representing you as a church. And I want to spend just a few minutes, it will be just a few minutes, I promise you, um, talking about LZ7 and the youth or young people teenage mission that's happening here in Rushton and Higham next year. I still can't really believe we're doing that. So um, as a dad of a teenager, the last few years I've become increasingly challenged by the lack of teenagers in church. Do you ever look around and wonder <laughs> where they've all gone? And then you go down the town or the park and you realise where they are. Oh, sometimes they're there, but probably they're at home on their phones, to be really honest. But where they're not is in church, mostly. Some of them are, but mostly they're not. Um, I went to a big church festival. It's called now, isn't it? They changed the name from Big Church Day Out because it's two days. It made a lot of sense. So I've been there a couple of times recently and um, really amazed by the impact of bands like this, this band LZ7 you're going to see in a few minutes, um, on their, their magnetism, their attraction for teenagers. Um, to me, the first time I heard it, I just thought, it was, to be frank, I thought it was a bit of noise and it's kind of not my kind of music. I have changed my view over time. I've really begun to, to understand why they're so attracted by it. But what I really respect about what they do is not necessarily what they do or say while they're playing one of their tracks. It's what they do and say in between and how they relate to the young people. Um, the, the, the front man, a chap called, guy called Linz, is phenomenally charismatic and his heart for God and for young people is like I've never seen. But when he speaks... The, the, the teenagers, just the response is like I have never seen. And most importantly, the response he gets from one is one that I know I would never get. My daughter and her mates, they, they don't, don't listen to me. They don't really care what I think. Uh, my views are fairly irrelevant because my lifestyle and the things that seem important to me I just don't re resonate with them. But these guys, they kind of buy the right to have that conversation. And when he flips his earpiece out in between the songs and he says, guys, is it all right if I talk to you? They're all going, yeah. Tell me, tell, tell me more. And he tells them. He tells them the gospel in a way that I just could not get an opportunity to do or heard in the same way. Whenever I hear these guys, um, I always get a bit of an emotional response. Personally, that's, that's not who I am normally. I'm normally really kind of just very matter-of-fact about almost anything. But when I see them play and speak and the way the young people respond, it always gets me in here. And you, you, you might see that, I don't know, but there's something phenomenal about seeing hundreds and thousands of young people going, I want to put Jesus in the driving seat of my life. Just phenomenal. So a big part of what these guys do is when they're not playing big gigs, and you'll see that on the screen in a few minutes, um, they go round to local schools doing mission weeks and they talk to them about well-being, about their mental health, about uh, intervening in their life, about the, 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 there's a positive future for you. Of course, they're not allowed to talk overtly about the gospel, but they talk about stuff, PSHE stuff, that schools really value. And then at the end of the week, they have a concert, or in our case, we're having two, on the Friday and Saturday night. We're going to be up at um, Park Road because there's no massive venues around here, but we want to get about 600 young people in to dance together and hear the gospel from these guys. And that's what they do. And we had a thing a few weeks ago, and one of the young people there said to him, because they came and did a bit of a pre-event, said, what, why are you doing this? Why are you here? I thought, what a brilliant question. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because this is the most important message that the young people could ever hear, isn't it? And we're trying to be God's conduit for transforming a generation here uh, or wherever God's placed us. So they're coming to next year. They, they are coming. God's will, God willing, but it seems to me they are definitely coming. They're coming between March the 4th and 9th. Um, and when you see the video, if you've not really seen that stuff, just think about how incredible that is, that these guys are coming to, to, to Rushton, to, to little old Rushton. I'm going to show the video. I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes. It's about six or seven minutes. I, th I, think, you'll, I think you'll find it really engaging. Uh, the soundtrack is quite low, so we might need to crank it up a bit. Um, and then I'll just tell you about what's next. That's all right. Thank you. Hey, man. My name's Lynn West. I'm the CEO of an organisation called Light. I'm also the front man to a band called LZ7. 
Our mission statement is to take the life-changing message of Jesus to young people through music. Have a watch of the video. I hope it inspires you as much as it does us to go and do this great work. Thanks for watching. Never give up. Just keep breathing. Tomorrow holds the answers to today's problems. God's got a plan for your life. He designed you the way that you are for a reason. Don't give up hope. If this is a decision you want to make, if you want to put Jesus in the driving seat and say, my past is done, my future's yet to come, help me forgive, forgive me. I want a hope and a future. When I get to three, simply do what my mum did and pop your hand in the air. Let's try this. Number one, Jesus loves you. Number two, he died on the cross so that you can have life. And number three, if you really want to put him in the driving seat, put your hand up in the air right now. Wow, you guys are incredible. Dear God, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry for the wrong things that I've done. I say yes to you right now. Thank you that you forgive me and help me forgive what's been done to me. Thank you that you love me that much. Come and live in my heart. Thank you I have a hope, I have a future. I have something to look forward to. Amen. You guys are incredible. Give yourselves a round of applause. Now, this is, this is what I need you to do. Is, um, I want to give you a gift. If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, just put your hand up if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it. I want to give you one of these AAA passes.
Peace comes like a deep energy within. My peace comes to be content in my own skin. I'm free to be everything that God's got for me, but that freedom came out of Christ, and I believe that time was picked up by Christ. I hope my future lies at the foot of a cross, one price paid for my bed loss. So when the world's at war, my heart's at peace. When there's war on the outside, outside, inside, there's peace. Because when they try to bury us, because they don't understand us, up out of the dirt will rise, because somebody truly fought and won for us. I believe his name is Jesus, so I'll choose life. And I'll fight for peace. Thank you so much for listening to me, Leeds. I appreciate it. Now, of course, those of us at Whitefriars, or you guys here at the mission, just can't do this on your own, can you? But the, uh, the group we pulled together, pretty much all the churches have signed up to this locally. And I'm as confident as they're coming. On March the 5th next year, they're going to be here, and they're going to be in our schools. They've already signed up to do it. They want them to come in and do the work. Uh, we're going to clear out Park Row Baptist Church. And if you can imagine cramming all of that into a church where you're going to get 300 people in, the roof's probably literally going to explode and kind of <laughs> land on the surrounding area. But the impact on our area, to me, seems going to be phenomenal. So, it's up to us to make it happen. They'll come and they'll deliver a, a, a tried and tested formula. As you can see, they go around the country doing this. We've got seven months to land this, um, and we need to get alongside young people and introduce them to Jesus. And this is a way to help us do that. I don't know about you, but that seems quite scary to me in some ways. Um, so, what do we need to do? Well, three things I just wanted to uh, ask you if you would uh, join us with. First of all is prayer. Not just for this project, or this mission, but pray for the young people uh, that in your family, in your church, and in, in, in the area around. If you can remember what that's like, and it doesn't take long to forget because you get so caught up in your own life, that's a tough part of life. There's all sorts of distractions and things trying to pull them away. For a lot of people, it's not very cool, is it, going to church? It's not very cool believing in Jesus, maybe. Although I've got something to tell you at the end about that. 
How are we, as churches in this area, individually and together, how are we going to love them unconditionally and show that? Because culturally, this isn't an obvious place for teenagers to come, is it? None of our churches are. How are we going to make that transition? Please be praying for that. Um, Steve Pearman at uh, Highfield, uh, he's going to start helping us the next few weeks produce a regular uh, prayer letter, so it'll keep you more informed about that. Please pray with us for this. Secondly, we want your money. <laughs> okay, there's no easy way to say that. We often talk, dance around that a bit, don't we? The, the, the financial response to this has been unbelievable. And it's going to cost us quite a lot of money, but we've already got almost all the money being pledged. We've had about £4,500 actually deposited in the account that we're sharing, but there's a lot more money being pledged. I reckon we're a couple of thousand pounds away from making it what we want it to be. Because we want this, this week to come and be really good quality. We need to put these guys up and feed them while they're here. We need to provide them accommodation. This is their job, so, you know, it does cost proper money. The IT stuff is phenomenally expensive, um, all that sort of stuff. But also what we need to do in the follow-up weeks, and you will have seen a big emphasis on the video, is this is about discipleship. As the band say, this is not about the circus coming to town, doing something exciting and then just disappearing. This is about changing people's lives. So it's the week after, the, the, the six and then 12 weeks after, that we want, need some help. And everybody can play a part. Now, you might feel you're somebody who can sit down and help lead a small group. You might feel your gift is much more about preparing food or uh, being there on the night and doing stewarding or any number of things. But we need to land this this week, which we will, and then these follow-up courses to, to build relationships. Because what they found where they go is a large number of people come. I'll just tell you how, how popular these guys are. They came and did an afternoon at Park Road a few weeks ago, which was for our church youth group kids. Some of you may have been along to that. Some of you may know. We put something on our Facebook page at Whitefriars, and it was just very discreet. And we had a contact from a church in London asking if they could bring a load of young people up. These guys are really popular. If these, church, if these tickets don't fly out when we do this, we'll have done something wrong because they, 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 they'll, they'll just fly off the shelf. They are really pit, uh, big, these guys. So um, it feels to me like this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, probably, to do something different for the young people in our town and something hopefully this generation of teenagers will look back to in years to come and be able to identify how this changed things. So we started, uh, I know you guys have already started fundraising. Tom was talking about that. It's absolutely amazing, thank you. That not, not all of us have got thousands of pounds to give. Every little bit would just be phenomenally helpful. Thank you very much for what you're doing and working with us in that. If you want to talk to us about that, so, some people have come up and spoke to you privately say, I'd really like to give some money to this. We, we, we can sort that. I'm, I'm not going until I've had coffee. So. Um, uh, please come and chat to me afterwards. That would be uh, amazing. So there's prayer, there's money, there's jobs. What could you do? There's so much to do, and we can all together um, uh, contribute. I'm, I'm phenomenally positive about this. I just, I don't see how it can't work. I know that with God, anything is possible. But, do you know, we, we've, had, we've had some Christian philanthropists who said, yeah, we'll match fund. What? Yeah, yeah, we'll match fund that. We've had a guy turn up at our church, he was at Park Road for a little while, who works for the Louis Palau Mission. He does organise events like this for a living, massive events. Going, wow, what's going on there? We've had people pledge thousands of pounds. Going, okay, there's some, something going on here. This is phenomenal. I've never seen a response quite like this. I've probably spoken to too, for too long. I'm going to be quiet in a moment. But just before I do, I just wanted to share something with you. Last Christmas Day, we were driving to church, me, my wife, and my daughter, in the car, on the way to work for a Sunday morning, Christmas Day, 10, 15, or whatever it was. Now, my daughter's kind of gone beyond Radio 1. It's not quite cool enough, so they listen to Radio 1 Extra, which is like another step beyond my experience. <laughs> but it's all rap kind of music, but it's where her and her mates listen. She put this thing on, and on Christmas Day, there's a three-hour gospel show on Radio 1 Extra. <laughs> What's that? What, what are we listening to? And this is not just culturally gospel-style music. This is the presenters talking about their relationship with Jesus. This is full-on evangelism going on on, the, on on this probably the most influential radio station nationally for, for these guys. And that really made me start thinking, 
Is it Jesus that's the barrier to relationship? Or is it us in our churches? I don't say that above a way of criticism to any of us. I'm just made me really wonder, what do we need to do to make the gospel more relevant and accessible to our young people? Because I don't think Jesus is a problem. They're happy to talk and listen about him. Thank you very much for listening. Um, great to be here. Uh, looking forward to spending some more time with you this morning. If you want to have a chat later, please come and grab me. I'm all up for that. Thank you. Group? Yeah, thank you, Simon, for sharing that with us. It's great to hear. It's really encouraging. Yeah, that's a good question. Where are the songs? I think they're... Time's going on, but we, we're going to have a couple of worship songs here. Um, so I'm messing about a bit, but uh, I'm giving people a chance to get their microphones at a suitable height. And it's the only snag we're having young people's worship group. They're all shorter than we are. Somewhere there. Right, we're going to sing a, a couple of songs together and then we're going to pray for the young people before they go out to their group. And we're going to sing Waymaker to start. <clears throat> Is he not playing with us? No. Oh. 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Yes, we come to worship you this morning, Lord. You are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, our light in darkness. Thank you, Lord that you are here today, ready and willing to touch our hearts if we just open ourselves to you. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat>
deserve more than we can ever give in praise or worship. You just deserve everything and so much more. So we just come and bring our worship to you today. Not just the worship of our lips, Lord, but the worship of our lives too. So that we lay our lives down to serve others for you. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. And Lord, we would just lift our young people to you now as they go out to their own group. Father, that your blessing might rest on them and remain with them and with their uh, teachers, Lord. Amen. 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 Yeah, young people, you can leave. Oh, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Just realise maybe we need to, as much as it looks good, there's a lot of walking around as a minister, going back and forth with the stage as it is. Although, I much prefer it looking like this than the way we had it before. Let's join me in a word of prayer before I come. Father, as I come to share your word, Lord, I just pray first and foremost to you and ask that, Lord, it will be you who speaks. Lord, if you have called me to this position like you call others to their position, then, Lord, I pray that you will honor it by blessing it for your glory and name. Lord, I just pray also for each person that is here that, Lord, your will will be done in their life. Lord, many church traditions pray the Lord's Prayer. Whatever tradition they may come from, some don't, but nearly every one of us knows it to some degree. And Lord, one part of that says, Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not our will, not the way we want it, but how you want it, Lord. And help us to live such a life that our life on this earth is spent to fulfill your will to our last breath. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see people come into your kingdom. Because Lord, if we don't, then what are we here for? Lord, we're not simply here to wait to get to heaven. We are here to do a walk. As long as it is day, Lord, we are here to walk for you. And help us each to find our place, to know our place, and to walk and to do as you instruct us to do. So, Lord, bless this time. Bless these people. Lord, I have expectancy of you moving as you are amongst us when we come and gather. But, Lord, you have your way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now... I had purpose to want to speak about the church and go through what apostles and leaders are, and I haven't managed to do it, and I've wrestled this with God. I had written notes out on what an apostle is, what a prophet is, you know, what roles they play, what it means today, and I just can't do it every time I've come up. And I've been praying and asking as I'm going to be having a week off with family this coming week. Like, Lord, what is it you're wanting me to say? This is what I feel I'm supposed to say, but what is it? How do you want me to lead these people? Because it's not about me getting up for a half an hour and saying what I like and what I agree with. And I'm not getting up here 
to win friends and influence people. I'm getting up here to preach the gospel. It's not whether people are going to agree with it or not, but those who will are those who are going to go on. And that's the company I want to be investing in, is are we going to go on with God together? Whatever stage we're at, looking out for one another. And are we then going to serve those that are outside that are not yet come in? There's an old Irish preacher by the name of W.P. Nicholson. I like those kind of names. W.P. Nicholson. He was from the north. That's the only downside. He didn't come from the Republic of Ireland. <laughs> but he was a great preacher. And he said this. He says, everywhere he went, he was an evangelist at heart. Everywhere he went, two things happened. There was either a revival or a riot, but there was never anything in between. And I think this, are our churches too safe? Are our lives too sterile? Are we just sometimes a little bit too comfortable? We don't defend. We don't want to say the wrong thing because God forbid we tell the truth sometimes as it is. Because in some tenses we think, you know what? When we think of the truth, this is what I sometimes feel. God, am I living up to that? Have I earned the right to say that? Am I really living this way? Because what you should never do as a Christian is speak from a self-righteous position that you're above people. I'm better than people because I don't probably drink as much alcohol as they do. Or I drink, or I eat the right food, or I do the right thing. I've never had an affair I've never cheated on someone. I've never done a dodgy business deal. You know, maybe there's a, there's a sense of a self-righteous attitude that you look down upon people. Maybe it's something else. But see, the question I ask myself, and as I get up here this morning, I did a lesson during the week with the kids at home. A very short little lesson. And I read from the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to read from it now because I think it is instructive. And if you wish to turn, you can turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, reading from verse 1. God doesn't want us to be self-righteous. He doesn't want us to be sterile. He's called us to be on fire for Him. And the question we need to always ask ourselves, is the fire in your heart burning for Christ? Or are you burning with lust for something else? Or is your heart gone elsewhere? Because God wants us to walk with Him. And I think these verses have something to tell us. And there's one verse I want to focus on in particular. But let's listen to this introduction. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction and to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple and to the young person knowledge and discretion. Now, this is the verse I will be focusing on in a while. A wise man or a wise person will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain to wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Now, listen to what verse 7 says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In fact, let me just carry on for a minute. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Now, I don't know about you, but the sense of a, a, a graceful ornament on your head. If you think of a king or a queen who sits there, there's something majestic when you look upon a person that is sitting there in a robe and they've got a, a, this you know, kind of crown of something on the head. And do you, do you see what God's telling us? 
Hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. But here's something extremely important. It says that a wise person will hear and will increase in learning. And a man of understanding will attain to wise counsel. I remember one time being asked by a lecturer to take wise sayings and flip them around. Now think of wise sayings that have been said to you or you've heard or you've grown up with and turn them around. And you know the one that came to me straight away? Uh, early to bed, early to rise, makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise. But if you turn that around, the opposite is also true. Late to bed, late to rise, and I know, I'm not judging anybody here. If you go to bed, it's not my, it's, it's not my business, but it is very true. If you go to bed, you get your sleep, you wake up, you think clearer, but if you flip it around, the opposite is also true. Now, I had a man, a minister, and I disagree with this counsel. says, oh, I sleep for four hours a day. I get up and I pray from four till six, and I probably go to bed around two or around 12. And I thought, that's a recipe for disaster because your body cannot function on four hours of sleep your whole entire life long, maybe for a season and if you're younger. But if you want to be at your optimal best, you need to follow instructions. But you also need to know your body pattern. Because this is what you learn as you get older. The same amount of energy you had when you were younger is not the same as you get older. And if you don't learn, if you're able to drink coffee in the morning or late at night, or how many hours you're able to stay up for. Here's one I've learned. If I stay awake after half ten, I cannot get up at four in the morning. But if I'm in bed at nine, I'll be awake at half three even without an alarm clock. And I just know. And I don't always go to bed at those times, but I've learned my body. But we need to learn ourselves. And this is one thing as Christians we need to learn if we're going to go and grow with Him, is that we need to grow in wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now here's what I classify as wisdom, biblical wisdom, to know what to do, to know, have information, it's to know, it's to have knowledge. And you often see naturally with older people, naturally they have wisdom. You know why? Because in their youth they made all the mistakes. And generally with the older they get, they're able to do things a little bit better. And if I'm going to listen to counsel, godly counsel, I will seek out, not a young man or a young woman, I'm going to seek out an older person that's walked that path and is able to give me wisdom. That doesn't mean everyone that's older has that wisdom. You have to seek them out. But you need to seek the right counsel from those that know and those that have understanding. Our understanding to me is a little bit like instruction or knowledge. It's not just knowing what to do. It's knowing how to do it. Now, I have assembled many an Ikea wardrobe. <laughs> and I know when I look at that picture, I say, I can put that together, no problem. I've got the know-how. Wisdom is like having the skill. I can do a little bit of DIY, probably not too much. You know, drilling holes in walls can go a little bit pear-shaped, but most other things, I can do it. I don't mind heavy lifting, all those things. I, I can do it. But if I don't follow the instructions... It's a recipe for disaster. And here's a lesson for you uh, married couples that have, or even those that might have a girlfriend, try to put together a piece of furniture together. See how well you got on there. That's just a little side note there. <laughs> Wisdom and instruction need to go together. It's not enough to know you have to follow the instructions in order to do what you know. And God's truth is the same. And isn't it interesting that after this introduction, what we're told is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of instruction. I'm telling you, 
it will be good if there's a little bit more fear of the Lord in our lives and in our own hearts. Before we start looking at everybody else in the church and outside there, it will be good if that fear was there. When I learned to drive a car, I was told this lesson. Look at your wing mirror and look in the mirrors and always look as though you're asking permission, can I do this? And I thought, that sounds ridiculous until I started to do it. In my head, I'd look at the mirror, I'd look behind me, I'd look at the sides, and I would ask permission. You know what I learned? It directed me to know if I was going to pull out of a blind spot and ram into the side of someone's vehicle or not. That lesson has carried me all the way through in my driving. Looking at the wing mirrors to see, can I go out? Is it safe to go out? Because if I just thought, well, I know I can drive a car, I can keep it on the road. There's other users on the car too. And a valuable lesson my father passed on to me was this. I've always remembered it. Never expect a driver on the road to do what they're supposed to do. Because a part of you knowing what to do and being instructed as to know what to do is also look out for other drivers. And as Martin will attest on the way home, he had at least three drivers pull out and do what they weren't supposed to do on the way home last night. So it's not just enough to know. But sometimes it's for your own safety that you know what to do. And God help you if you end up following the example of other people that are not doing the right thing. Because what you're never going to say when you stand before God is, well, Linda did it, so I must, have, I must do it too. Peggy did it. You know, Adina and Cyril were doing it, so we just went along with them. Or it was, you know, that Bob went up that way, so I just decided that must be the way to go. Because you need to follow what you know. And you know what, it, you know what God told Israel of old? I am going to send false prophets among you to test you. And it was the test, are you going to be wise and follow the instruction I'm giving you? Or are you going to go after false preachers, false prophets that are going to mislead you? And here's the deal. These false prophets did miracles. If you're led astray and don't know how to discern something that's of God, we are in trouble, people. But wisdom and knowledge goes together. It's not enough simply to know, but we need to have the instructions to know how. And if you want to grow and become wise, you would do well to take verse 5. A wise person will hear and will increase in learning, and a, ma a person of understanding will attain to wise counsel. If you want to grow or to do anything, if any of you have ever studied, or even like when you've gone to school, but if you've ever studied anything, or you've done an apprenticeship, you're told what to do, you're showed what to do, and then you are expected to follow what you've been showed and what you've been told what to do. Because if you think you know how to do it without listening to the instructions and without following what your teacher says, you're not going to succeed. You're never going to succeed. And in the Christian life, if you want to be wise, we need to learn to listen to what God says and follow what God says. See, there's plenty of us, and I'm going to say this is me included. I think I know a lot. But if I don't live by anything I say, then all that knowledge, all that wisdom, doesn't mean a single thing. It doesn't mean a single thing. I want to turn to Acts chapter 1 for a moment, and I've read this before, but let me read what it says beginning from chapter 1. And again, this is an introduction to the epistle. And it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. Now, let me just take you through what generally happened in the Gospels with Jesus and followers to try to tie this into the verse. 
When Jesus called a person to follow him, it was literally to walk with him, to do as he did. And he followed the pattern of telling them what to do, showing them what to do, and then releasing them to do it. And in order to do that, you needed to be in the process of listening, watching, and then applying it into your life. That's simply it. Listening, watching, and then applying it. That's how and the only way you will grow in understanding and wisdom and knowledge. And though Jesus is not physically here now, He still teaches us and leads us and guides us and instructs us. And it says that He wrote about all that Jesus both began to teach and all that He began to do until the day that He was taken up. But do you know by the time Jesus was to be taken up, He had trained His disciples and He had called some of those disciples to be apostles. They were to take over the lead role. He just didn't give them a week's evangelistic training or a discipleship course. He came alongside them. And as we've heard from Simon, and as we've been plugging the LZ7 here in the church, the band are not just going to come and whack them full of biblical knowledge and then fly off. There's going to be a discipleship course that follows. Because when people make decisions, they have to be discipled. And in order to be discipled, we need to be living as disciples ourselves in whatever role that you will end up playing. Because Jesus left the apostles to do and carry on the walk that He was already doing and through them would continue to do. Because He wasn't just saying, okay, I'm going now, you go off. Remember what He says in John? It's beneficial I go. Because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy, the Holy Spirit to you. And He is going to fill you and He is going to empower you. And if anything, the baptism of the Spirit or the second blessing or anointing, whatever word you want to use, one evidence you have it is a boldness comes in. There's a boldness to share. See, it's not just having the knowledge you're now giving the Spirit that instructs you and enables you to do it. There's an old Scottish preacher called Duncan Campbell, and I read his account. God used him mightily as a young man, as a Christian, but he drifted and said he went into years of dryness. Nothing happened. He became a minister. That was his goal, but he felt the ministry, being a, man, being a pastor, ended up becoming the thing, or one of the things that contributed to this dryness. And one morning, he says he was up writing a sermon at four in the morning, and he heard his young daughter singing a hymn. And he stopped and went to the daughter and says, why are you singing this? And she says, Father, I just love Jesus. And he says, at that, he felt God said to him, do you still love me? Are you in the place that your daughter, who's less than half your age, is in? And he says it was his young daughter that led him back to God. Now, I'm probably telling the story wrong. I would encourage you to go and Google it. Duncan Campbell, I'm sure I could find his testimony and put it out there in a group. But he said that God again visited him, that he got again that fire in his bones. But guess what? He went out and preached the same sermons, the same message, but you know what began to happen? People began coming to the Lord again. People began getting saved, and the minister came and visited him and says, Duncan, what's happened? God's visited you. He says, well, I'm preaching the same sermons. I'm doing the same thing, but now I'm doing it in the power and spirit of God. And that's the only way we can serve God, people. Now, I'm going to say this. Everyone has natural gifts as born on earth. Every one of us. I don't care what deficiency you have, you've been given gifts. God may choose to use that natural gift, but the gifts that God's interested in is the spiritual gifts that He imparts to you. 
And you cannot be a Christian without being given something and equipped to do something, whatever that may be. But your natural strength doesn't make a whim of a difference in the kingdom of God if you're not doing it under the direction of God's Holy Spirit and functioning in what He has you to do. Because it goes on to say that just as Jesus both began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up, after He, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom He had chosen. I want to say this. As much as they were chosen, do you realize those of you here that have put your faith in Christ, He's also chosen you. And it doesn't matter what He's going to ask you to do. It doesn't matter what it is. The important thing is, are you doing what He's asked you to do? Are you doing what He's asked you? Because I don't believe any single person can be a Christian and not in some way be able to discern God. And your discernment may have dulled over time. Maybe you've drifted a bit. Maybe you're on fire. But you know what God's saying to you. I will never seek to manipulate you from this pulpit or get you to do what I think you should be doing. You need to be listening to what God is doing and what God is saying. My role here is to minister and to pastor. And I'm here to preach the Word of God. And you should call me out if that's what I'm not doing. Whether I'm doing a good job of it (laughs) is questionable. But I am here for you to be able to discern. And you are equally as chosen as anyone else. And it doesn't matter what role you're doing, as long as you know you're doing it and following God's instruction. And God's instruction is contained here in this book. Whatever translation you're reading, as long as it's a translation of God's Word and not out of someone's imagination... This is how he's going to speak to you. It's in his book. It's able to make you wise. May not make you earn thousands of pounds. May not give you a swimming pool. It may not get you those things, but it can make you wise if you're willing to follow the master's instructions. And it also goes on to say here, one of the last things that Jesus said before parting was wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. Wait. Wait until the promise comes. That's what he says. He says, look at wait. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now, but wait. And they did wait. And here's the important thing. They followed what God asked them to do. Before I close, I want to put three things to you that are of extreme importance. And the first thing is, what this book has to say will not benefit you anything if you're not forced in Christ. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, if you have not put your trust in Him. I am constrained... uh, extremely, I don't know why I'm getting tongue-tied, extremely concerned when I hear someone say, I go to this church because I like the music, I like this, I like that. We choose where we want to be based on what we like, and we go by how we feel. And that concerns me, and I'm going to tell you why. Because you should go where God will put you. And I never meant this in any way insulting. I thought I was going to be a Pentecostal pastor. That's where my desire was. I thought I came to England to learn how to be an evangelist and then be released somewhere into the Republic of Ireland and go around preaching the gospel. Well, shortly after going to Cliff College, I just knew in my heart God took Ireland away from me. I just knew I wasn't going home. I didn't know I was staying here Six months later, I realized who my wife was going to be. A year after that, we got married. And then a year after that, I finally finished, or a year or so after that, I finished Cliff College. And now I'm living here with four children and a wife and a mortgage. And I entered into the Wesleyan Reform Union. I never regret that decision for one minute because that's where God wanted me. 
I thought I was going to go where I felt God was leading me. Because I was in a Pentecostal church back in Ireland. But that wasn't God's choice. I was told, and Margaret will tell you, Margaret was told the same thing, to buy a house in Milton Keynes in an area I just didn't want to go to. But I says, okay, maybe we're crazy. Maybe we had too much cheese the night before, and we thought this is what God's telling us to do. But we you know what we said? Let's act on it. We bought a house in an area we didn't like. I'm, I'm going to be honest, we didn't like it. We bought it in faith. But guess what? It was the best house I ever lived in. And my only regret was we only lived in it for two and a half years before God moved us on. But are you where God wants you to be? And more importantly, are you first and foremost in Christ? Not just in a, in a building, but are you in Jesus? And if you're in Christ, the Scripture says in Colossians, seek those things that are above, because you have died to this world, and your life is hid in Christ. Now, it's not often you'll ever hear me repeat words of a communist, but there was a famous communist that said these words, when you become a communist, you sign your death warrant, and you're just a dead person in furlough, which means whatever we tell you to do, you ought to do. But do you realize when you're in Christ, you have died to yourself? Whether you feel it or not, that's a fact. And the only reason you are still here is to do what God wants you to do. And I say this particularly to men. Your first responsibility if you're married is to your family. Not to the work of the church. It's first and foremost to your family. Next to God, and if, in fact, if I'm going to put an order, it's serve God, serve your family, beginning with your wife, and then your children, and then everything else. And if you get that order mixed up, then that's led to an awful lot of unhappy marriages and an awful lot of unhappy families. Because your Christianity must begin in here and then spread out. Now, I know whatever mistakes sometimes we may make, that it doesn't always happen that way, but I believe that is God's order. But well, we need to be in Christ. And people, are we in Christ this morning? Have we made that decision to follow? And are we following Him? And the second is just that. When we are in Christ, we are called to follow Him on His way. Now, I'm going to take this lesson from yesterday's walk. We went on a walk in the mountains. And I had an awful lot of sermons come to me from this walk yesterday. There's a good group of us. Great. The weather wasn't great, but it was a great walk. It was quite challenging, not for the faint of heart. But everyone completed it. But there's a big difference between a walk and a race, people. See, when you train for a race, you don't train to come last. You train to come first. That's the whole purpose of it. If I'm racing you, and I'm not going to because I'm too slow, but if I was, I want to be the best. I want to be the winner on the day, and I want to do everything that I can do to be at my optimal best on that day. I want to follow the right instructions. But when you do a walk, you walk together. And a lesson I learned is, a mile up the road, some people were walking, and then there was people way back here. But do you realize when God walks with you, He walks together, step by step, and He comes down to your level. He doesn't run ahead and say, come on, come on, David. David, come on, catch up. No, He does not. He comes down to your level right where you are. He says, come, David. You're struggling? Come on. You fell over? Come on, I'll carry you. I'll link your arm. I'll take your hand. But if you're a mile up the road, you don't know where people are. Because the strength of walking with people is being at the back where the people that struggle are. If you want to run a race, go ahead and run the race. But when we're walking with God, we're not to run ahead of Him. And too often, some of us are running so far ahead, we think we know. And you fall flat on your face. Or you take a walk into a field with a bull. Or you get stuck in cow pat. Or you end up on a rocky ridge and that you're about to fall off. And the idiots that we are, we're saying, God, help me. And God says, well, it would have helped you if you had a stead on the path, or you would have just taken my hand 
And this is what happened yesterday. We were walking in a rain cloud. And the only reason some people stopped ahead was because they didn't know where they were going. And thank God they did, because some of it was quite treacherous. But when God wants to walk with us, he says, come on, Kim, take my hand. Simon, take my hand. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm going to show you the way to go. And like he says when he gives us the Spirit, I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to teach you the way you should go. I'll lead you into truth. God wants to show us wonderful things and do wonderful things. But we need to learn this lesson of following the Master's instructions. So we need to be in Christ and we need to be following Him. And I'm going to close with this point. If you are in Christ and you're following His instructions, leave the results to God. I have tomato plants and chili plants grown out the man's garden. Some of those plants are not doing good and some of them are flourishing. How can you tell a plant is not doing good? Well, I'm going to give you some of them. It's either stunted, it just looks anemic. <laughs> I have a, a plant out the back that is really not doing great. It has one tiny little tomato hanging off it. You know why that is? Because I didn't transplant it when it should have been transplanted. I have a bush variety that's growing, it's flourishing, it's green, it smells great, there's flowers, but it's just too small because the pot shouldn't be in that pot. And maybe I'm not going to get any fruit of that at all for the season. But there are others that are divine variety and they're up here and there's beautiful tomatoes all along it that I can't wait to eat. And some of them are starting to go yellow in the, on the sun gold variety. But you know how you know? Because it looks healthy and it's producing fruit. You are not in control of producing fruit in your life. God is. But when you follow his instructions and when you're in him, then he will produce the fruit in your life. Now, the ones that are producing fruit in my back garden, I've had to prune. You know why? And they, look, they may not look pretty, but they are producing good fruit. Because I don't want any energy going into leaves or into little shoots coming between the stems and the branches, robbing that plant of energy. I want that energy going into the right place, and that's into the fruit. And that's the same thing God will do through you when you follow his instructions, when we learn to listen. Because when you learn to listen, you will grow in wisdom. And you will know what to do. You will know what the master's plan is. You will know your place. God has great things he wishes to do with us. But we need to learn that simple lesson. And if you get nothing else, think of what that proverb says. Learn to listen and then to apply the little you know. I was told this going into an exam. I was never good at languages beyond English growing up. And maybe you'll say, well, your English is not that good anyway. But I felt God tell me to do Hebrew and Greek for a year or two in Cliff College when I was there. And I remember really nervous going into the exam. And my wife said this. She said, look, here's advice I was given. What you know, know really, really well. Don't worry about knowing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And you had to learn verb tables and you had to be able to write sentences. And I was like, God, you know, help me. And you know what I did? I applied the instructions she gave me. And I got about 80, 90% in the test. Because I was learning a bit of this and a bit of that. And she says, no, what you know Make sure you know it, that whether your eyes are closed, you can write it backwards. But don't worry about the things you don't know. And if God shares something with you, and he will share many things, make sure you make note of it and apply it. Because what he asks us to do is not hard. He wants us to grow, and he wants us to flourish. 
we've been given a commission that He wants us to fulfill. And this is what we need to ask ourselves if we're thinking of bearing fruit. Lord, is our church winning the lost? Are we passionate about prayer? Are we passionate about giving? Are we passionate about giving everything we can to God? Are we seeing fruit? Am I seeing fruit? Because I want to see fruit in your life. I don't care if a person ends up a better preacher than me, <laughs> a more effective man and woman are winning the lost. But is that what we're doing? And is that what we're producing? Because that's what we're here for. Because God's given a commission to all of His church to go forth and make disciples and be disciples. Now I'm going to ask the band to come back up. I will be off next week as uh, David has sent out, but I will be back uh, the following week after. So if you do need to contact me, uh, I won't be around. But just let me pray as the band begins. Father, I just pray for everyone here that, Lord, you will encourage them where they are. You will bless them. Lord, it's, we are not here to impress you. Lord, you love us without the things that we try and do to please you. And you just want us to know that you love us. You died for us. You are there for us. You want us, Lord, to know that you have those things in hand. And I just pray, Lord, that will you give us wise hearts that hear and listen and follow your instruction. Lord, bless and guide each soul here that they will know their place in the position that you have put them in in this life and that they may flourish and grow to the glory of God. Amen. I'm going to finish with this song called Love Each Other. It doesn't exactly follow up uh, what David has said, but it is about following Jesus. to be this is what i want the world to see 
Amen. Amen. Amen.